Hey guys, welcome to Firecraft. Today we will be reviewing a line of duty death determination. Uh, it's the NIOSH report summary, and we're going to go over the recommendations that they outlined in the report. This is not meant to be a criticism of the operations by the firefighters. This is just a review of the important aspects outlined in the report that I think is beneficial for all firefighters at all ranks. Uh, this is based on the incident on April 6, 2013 in the Philadelphia Fire Department. A captain, career captain, fell off the roof and died at a commercial structure fire. Okay, initial box alarm was for smoke in the basement of a fabric store. This was a particular incident where the store owner was told about it and he actually took about 30, 40 minutes to actually go investigate it and call it in. So as you see, the fire had headway long before um, the fire department arrived there. It's a commercial first floor store, fabric store. So as you can imagine, uh, it was fuel loaded and with the late reporting and it just went straight downhill from there. If you want to read the scenario, then go to download the NIOF, NIOSH uh, fire report right here, 2013-07. Again, we're just gonna go over the general factors and recommendations as, as it applies to fire ground operation. They report as contributing factors as a delay of reporting. As I told you, it's about, it was about 30 to 40 minutes after it was first noticed by I think uh, either a customer or whoever, and then they reported to the store manager who then took another 30, 40 minutes. Man, who knows, right? This could have been going on for a couple hours. Fire was in a non-sprinkled commercial building. You know, these are one of these 100 year old, over 100 year old or Navy construction buildings. And they've been rehabbed probably once or twice. Again, they, they say that uh, the building construction and design, as I just outlined, uh, and huge or high fire load, limited access, to the fire due to excessive merchandise. Lack of situational awareness. Now let's go over the key recommendations. To me, these are the gems of these investigation reports. Uh, I was first surprised a long time ago when I started reading these, how much good information they had in them. It says fire department should integrate current fire behavior research findings. I bet you that has a lot to do with um, aggressive firefighting, transitional firefighting, I know in my time uh, when I was in the department, when I was starting out and you know, the old timers would tell you, don't shoot water into the fire. They would yell at you. What are you doing? Now, I'm not gonna get into the whole generational differences and the fact that maybe, you know, some of us have some background education in college or whatever and in science. <laughs> it's like, hey, water does, uh, whatever you know resetting the fire as we now call it and um and there's still i mean i mean i still see it today right there's still this argument about on um, transitional you know um and let me tell you um i say you do what works but make sure you know all of them you know and you choose this or the tactics that you believe are going to work best okay i'm not going to say don't do um transitional I mean, I'm an aggressive guy. I come from an aggressive uh, fire department in the, in the Northeast. You had to get in there and knock it down quick before the whole role was lost. And that was usually the case. But we're going to move on, okay? Fire departments should consider implementing a pre-incident planning program. Guys, now I've worked for and with three different fire departments. A metropolitan size one. I worked in uh, my career in a small town fire department and I also worked in my as a volunteer in my town that I moved into. And I could tell you, everybody needs to do some of this, the pre-incident planning program. I think it will go a long way. That I'll, I'll definitely will cover that in some detail today and, and in the future. Wouldn't it be nice to know the right all the time if um, you have some good intelligence on a building, the entrances, the exits, people, uh, the fire load, Okay, again, to enhance situational awareness, consider implementing a critical building information system. With MDTs, um, the display terminals, sometimes they're laptops, sometimes they're dedicated proprietary terminals. It's nice if you have them, right? And if you have them, that they're updated. 
these are difficult times guys and I've been in um, and I've worked with the police side on their system and on the fire side and I could tell you it's nice when you can get funding technology is becoming cheaper this you know this might be something that you, you, you can actually implement in a much smaller basis company-wide battalion-wide I mean district-wide whatever they also state as a recommendation based upon department procedures the strategy and tactics of an occupancy should be defined yeah, I mean, you would think that at this point, right, all departments have uh, some level of this right now, right? Uh, SOPs. Everybody has SOPs. If I'm being critical, I think they were talking about more of knowledge of the SOPs and maybe more refined SOPs for the particular situation. Okay. They definitely talk about uh, the RIT teams, rapid intervention teams. And in this incident, it was a situation where the, the IC had a uh, put the... Had to remove members from the writ and assign them a fire ground task. And then he had to call for another engine or ladder to um, come staff the writ. Ensure all firefighters are trained on when to call a mayday. Guys, this is basic, right? You're your own best, I guess, friend on this one. For yourself and for your, um, man, your teammates. And don't be afraid, right? Don't be afraid. Think about that one. I as I, I guess as we get into other uh, reviews, that'll come up a lot. Fire department should provide the incident commander with a mayday tactical checklist in the event of a mayday. You would think by now that all SOPs will have a mayday list. And if not, you know, that's actually in one of the basic things to become a company level officer, right? Is to know your mayday tactics in general. But it has to be reinforced, I guess, into um, SOPs, departmental SOPs. So everybody's on the same page. Like all jobs that have these type of reports issued out on them, it's this always interesting reading. Here's a picture of the incident site. And this is, if, if I remember correctly, this is one block away from the famous South Street in Philadelphia, which I love to go to when I'm in town. Okay, it says here the structure was built prior to 1908. Brick walls with wooden floors and a flat wooden roof. Ordinary construction, right? No access to Side C or Side Charlie due to the adjacent one-story business and apartment building. Okay, but here we go. Here's a diagram of the job. Okay, and this here here's where the problem where they had access. They have. Uh, when the captain went down, they had uh, problems accessing him, rescue him. No pathway to the street. They had to breach a wall, but that's in the incident report. Sounds like a very tough job, along with a very tough recovery. Okay, this particular ordinary construction, part of the building had an eye beam and the joists were set into it, while the other half was traditional fire cut joists into um, pockets in the brick. This one, all uh, this building with the eye beam elongated because of heat, as you see, distorted and you had a collapse here. Is that obviously after the job, you could see the pockets for the joists. You know, when you see them like this, you can look at the quality of the brick, the mortar, right? Some stone, okay. Fire behavior and extension. The fire started in the rear of the basement. Probably the worst location, guys, right? That they can be. Anybody's ever had a, a basement fire, then you have it uh, loaded. Fire burned for 45 to 60 minutes before the store owner notified the fire department. He figured you write your reflex time. Dispatch, and, until, and then until the first unit goes on location. Man, one hour, right? How, and how would you know? How would you know that? Approximately 60 minutes into the incident, from the time of arrival of the first fire department resource, the three floors started to collapse. One hour. Now remember, right guys, uh, 20 minutes of heavy fire in an ordinary construction, or in any, uh, and you know you have to suspect the condition, if it's still safe to, conduct operations. So 60 minutes into the incident, now you had all three floors starting to collapse. And we know 20 minutes, and that could be just 20 minutes from the point of um, heavy fire, heavy burning. 
I mean, we, you know, you figured the incipient stage was what? One to two hours earlier? Three hours? You just don't know. And I think at this fire, they, yeah, they, they never even determined how it started. But the conditions weren't too bad. And even the timing wasn't that bad, right? Everybody's still alert up. Here's a map, a graphic of the pieces and their positioning. Hydrants. Lines. Uh, notice they have an inch and three quarter. Here's your supply from the hydrant. They, uh, they have a five inch and a three inch. A five inch here supplying this other engine. And interesting how you don't see too many lines. Okay, there were some emo emergency buttons activated. In fact, two people activated the emergency buttons on their portable radios. Then they stated we need someone to the rear of Bravo. All right, there's a man down back there, he just fell off the roof. Okay, communications inquired about the two emergency activations. Rescue one officer said it was for a man down. Asking if they were declaring a May Day. And then um, officer said somebody fell off the porch roof. Roof. As we go through here, right, you see, uh, we don't really see a May Day. The actual term de uh, declared. There's an issue with ground ladders. Okay, got a 16. Yeah, and then you had the, re the recovery, the rescue recovery. Managed to try to breach this wall through the building. Heavy smoke. To try to get to the man. Tough, man. I, it, okay. So now we start getting to the nitty gritty. Contributing factors. Okay, delay in reporting the fire. We know that. Fire in a non sprinkler commercial building. Welcome to the old part of town, right? The, the building construction and design, ordinary construction, right? It has its major deficiencies in, in its design. High fuel load, limited access, and with all that heavy smoke, uh, not being generally aware of the actual building, probably no access to any pre fire information the chaos of the fire scene okay let's get it now we're into the, rec the actual recommendations all right uh fire ground operates by developing sops conducting live fire training and revising fire ground tactics i'm not going to make excuses for fire department i think today this situation is even tougher that doesn't mean it's impossible okay to to conduct all this obviously they can uh, today, departments should be reviewing, always updating their SOPs. This, from my experience, is uh, the conducting the live fire training is always kind of rough because you're too busy fighting or you're just fighting a, a lot of fire and revising fire ground tactics. And as we know today, that can be problematic with old, old generation and new generation firefighters. Okay, how fires are different today. You building construction and composition of home furnishings and products, yes. And the Back in the day, right, they were mainly composed of natural materials such as wood and cotton, but now contain large quantities of petroleum products and synthetic materials that burn faster and hotter. And uh, guys, we, we obviously know this because every time we go to a fire, it fits a room in contents, right? It, 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 man, it's, it's going up quick. Where a fire once took 20 minutes to flash over, igniting all the contents, this can happen today in a little four or five minutes. And that's if you had somebody recognize that there may be a fire and call the fire department. At this point, every time you get to a fireman, you have to expect it's about to flash over if it shows like it hasn't obviously done so. Modern living spaces tend to be more open, less compartmentalized, better insulated than homes. Yes. Interior fires can generate an oxygen depleted, rich fuel environment within minutes. This condition of hot fuel smoke, rich smoke is highly reactive to the introduction of oxygen. Okay, introducing oxygen to this environment by opening a door or venting a window may result in the rapid transition to flashover. These same conditions in commercial uh, structures are as seen in the Charleston Sofa Superstore fire. Guys, if you haven't reviewed that LOD report, you need to. I actually think it is obviously one of the most tragic, but it's, 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 it's interesting. And we all have those type of buildings uh, all around us, combinations of methods for strategically 
ventilating and isolating fires to prevent flashover or at least delay it. Kicking a door open or breaking a window without knowledge of conditions inside can create a portal for air that can literally fan the flames by introducing oxygen in an oxygen limited fire environment. That's why we communicate, right guys? We communicate and when we're gonna ventilate, open up a door, open up a window, skylight, we coordinate. All parties coordinate, right, with the attack team. Additionally, fire suppression ops were conducted from the interior of the structure as a means to reduce water damage and limit fire damage to structures. These ops must be coordinated with ventilation operations. Okay, previous search, research and examinations of line of duty deaths have shown that ventilation events occurring with the firefighters in the structure prior to suppression have led to tragic results. Yeah, right, you don't break a window, open up a window. You don't break the door, right? You, you, you open the door, but you try to preserve the door so you can close it. And everybody must be in coordination when introducing oxygen, right? You either have a curtain up. Let's see what else we, we got here. One means of eliminating the possibility of this occurrence will be a transitional attack. Hey guys, it's in writing. <laughs> hey, I I believe in transitional attack, but I'm also aggressive. Well, I used to be aggressive. So, you know, I believe in all of them. It just depends what tactic um, you have to use that you feel that you can best accomplish your goal here, right? terminate this incident um, which water is directed into the structure from the exterior to cool the fire gases and reduce the heat release of the fire prior to the firefighters entering the building uh, major concern is the potential harm that it might that might occur to people trapped in the structure or the amount of water damage to the structure therefore measurements are needed to document the changes of the thermal environment within the structure and impact on the viability of people who might be trapped in the structure that is very true. But hey, nothing hurts a uh, short blast. You know, obviously there's uh, so many scenarios here where it's already self-vented or they report people trapped, you know, based on the uh, actual reports, time of day, evidence from outside the building that might indicate there might be occupants and so on. They, all, they recommend NIST and, and Underwriters Laboratory, they their research indicates the following fire ground operations should be considered for implementation. I know it sounds, guys, I don't saw, some of this may just sound so basic, but when you start reading some of these reports, it's not. <laughs> I mean, it's not. This is the reason why they're recommending this. The size up should occur at every fire. Size up should consider the resources available and the situation conditions, such as weather, fire location, size of the building, size of the fire and the building, and the construction features. Ensure a 360 size up, right? For those that don't know already, 360 size up is conducted whenever possible. You know, they say, right, three sides, but we always try to get 360. If you don't get three sides, then get somebody in there to give you that side you miss as soon as possible. Tactical plan for each fire must be developed, communicated, and implemented. A lot of this stuff is also covered in our course, the Fire Cram Commanding the Job Course First Two Operations. So check that out. Uh, we definitely go over all this in detail. Okay, ventilation. Uh, manage and control the openings to the structure to limit fire growth and spread and to control the flow path. This is new stuff, guys. I mean, it's new because it's come out a lot during the last 10 years. And and I'm glad. And you, you know, I've been pretty much an engine guy all my life. And let me tell you, you get your butt kicked deep in there when this stuff is not followed and you you know and you actually absolutely know when ventilation is going on because you feel the whole lift you, you it, the difference it's bad enough to get punished by the job in there and then yeah ventilation sh ventilation should be coordinated with suppression activities absolutely uncontrolled vent allows additional oxygen which may result in rapid increase no doubt of the fire and increased risk to firefighters. Here we go. What's our number one priority? Firefighter life safety. Due to the increased fire release rates within um, the flow path. Firefighting operations. Water should be applied as soon as possible. Right? And this is assuming the fuel rich environment that we operate in today. In many cases, water application through an exterior Opening into a fire compartment may be the best first action. Cool the interior spaces of a fire building with water from the safest location possible prior to committing personnel into spaces. 
or adjacent to fully developed or smoldering ventilation limited fire conditions. Rapid intervention procedures should be updated to provide water on the fire as soon as possible and control ventilation openings during firefighter May Day incident. This recommendation is presented to educate the fire service and ensure the fire department is considering changing fire ground tactics. Guys, if, man, if your departments aren't doing this, get on them. That was just the first recommendation that we have more. Uh, Pre-incident planning, guys, right? Look, if you don't have a electronic system where you're fed a printout or it goes over the MDT or the laptop, you know, maybe there might be something for the chief officers, but at the company level, if your engine doesn't have it, guys, just get out there and, 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 and do these. Make your own sheets up and make it available to other uh, companies. But get out there and try to do at least one or two a week. I always, I always love doing them. Especially, you know, these ones that are gonna be problematic fires, man. You know the buildings, you know the districts. Pre-fire planning is essential no matter the size of the department. And I know that sometimes you get a lot of older guys, senior guys, Nobody wants to go out and do it. Maybe you just want to drive around for training or, or, you know. But if it's in your district, I think it would behoove you, right, to get to know your area. But you know how cool it would be for you to actually write it up? Now you got somebody that's coming on overtime and now they got to deal with a, with a problem building in your area that could really be ugly. It could, and um, you, you have the high risk of loss of life. You know, it'd be real nice to have uh, some intelligence beforehand. These occupancies can include, but not limited to, schools, high-rise occupancies, hospitals, nursing homes, medical clinics, hazardous materials manufacturers. Wow, let me tell you, in my town, we had a few ugly, right? Multi-alarm, four, five, six alarms. I think we might even had an eight alarm at one of these hazardous chemical manufacturers, chemical plants, old chemical plants transportation agencies right railroad okay now usually right there's something written up I noticed in the past might have not been updated in 10 years definitely not in digital form but you know it depends on your town right maybe you guys are ahead of this maybe you're on it maybe you have it developing maybe they're just waiting on funding or maybe they're just waiting on somebody you know to just raise their hand up say hey man I I'll work on this so now here it covers what the pre-incident plan Guests should have to assist the incident commander, no doubt, in developing strategy and an incident action plan. And guys, we definitely go over this in commanding the job, okay? The online training that we offer. Detail pre-incident plan highlights all aspects of the structure, including, obviously, you see, this is, this is just, this is not all of it. <laughs> A site plan, floor plans, construction type, the age and condition of the building. Guys, in, man, in, I know in, in some of these older towns in the Northeast, but really pretty much in any large town or small town where you have ordinary type construction or wood or wood frame, boy, is this important stuff to know. Sometimes you can look at a building and if you see that they there's parging on on um on the masonry, right? Or on the bricks, man, what is behind that? How bad was it? You know, how bad is the brick? How bad is the mortar behind it? Oof. Is there water damage behind there just eating away at everything? The ingress and egress, of course. Pre-existing structure damage, that's what I was talking about, right? And after a while, when you start really inspecting these buildings up close, going to the basements, right, where you can sometimes see the uh, the walls, the foundations. Man, I've been into buildings where the brick looks great outside on an ordinary three-story. The basement, it's got those stone, right? Those 120, 130 old stone walls. They're just, when you touch them, all you have is dust fall off, right? The concrete, the mortar that they used back then, it's all dissipated. It's just barely being held in place. And then you have two or three stories of masonry and the weight on it going straight up. Dude, I, I, oof. Okay, the presence of wall and anchor plates, they're there for a reason. Right, engineered load systems, lightweight construction, type of doors and windows, the roof construction. And if there's any right heavy objects on there, renovation and modification to structure. And let me tell you, I assume 50% of all renovations are not to code or they were unpermitted. I mean, that's just, and I think that's at best in an old city. Height of the building, fuel loads, fire protection features, stairwells, utility shutoffs, occupant content information. Yep, yeah, that all, that would be great, right? 
right? Identifies deviations from normal operations. Instead of you having to figure it out, first do, boom. And now you gotta play detective and you gotta know what you don't know, man. It, it, and I know, you know, hey, that's why we get paid the big money. So darn hazardous, right? Do we have to, you know, and that's that's why it's important to get out there, man. It just you gotta you gotta try to find these out for you or your brother or sister, right? The strategy and tactics. So when you go up to a job, and this is gonna be a complex job, right? This is this is gonna be a big job, a major incident, major, you know, whatever. If it's gonna be a could be a two alarmer, three bagger, whatever. Uh, it's good to have some initial strategy and tactics. Especially if you're uh, the company officer showing up, the chief may be delayed. And I know for uh, my time in the volunteer department, um, man, chief can be delayed by, you know, eight or 10, 12 minutes or more. And here you are, this job is ripping, you know, and you're lucky to have maybe three guys show up and two of them are rookies. I'm not going to tell war stories, but it's, it, this will be great for a lot of guys have this kind of information. So look at this one, on this job, no information related to the fabric store was available. According to the fire department members, the, occupy, the occupancy was not considered a target hazard per department protocol. Man, I know this, this district, I actually shopped in this district and you have all these fabric stores and they're loaded up and they've been there for a hundred years. That's, you know, uh, man, uh, not being critical, it's just, when it goes bad, it, it goes real bad. And guys, you can prevent this uh, for yourself in the future. Okay, number three, to enhance situational awareness, consider implementing a critical. But you know, one thing I can say is, this is something definitely you could do in, um, in your district. Examples could be, you know, features that you would like highlight would be bolst bolstering trust, major alterations has occurred. Right, and in the in the plan you would, or the database, or the card, or whatever system you would use, right? You would uh, highlight hazardous substances, high voltage. This this can be a big one with all the renovations going on over the years. These older buildings, right? If they're interconnected in a weird way, don't forget some of these interconnections are not permitted. They weren't. They weren't. Uh, done with under review from city code and they can be literally mazes because maybe they have a lot of immigrants you know and they're not going to complain and there's weird situations and you're going in there at nighttime in a job and people are trapped and there's like you know 10 or 12 little apartments oh man building with structural hazards or heavy fire loading renovated buildings right we're hitting boys duplex apartments man i'll see triplex like They'll make one apartment into three on the second floor. Uh, uh, trust buildings, right? We don't trust those. Metal bar joists, other lightweight construction materials. Handicap, bedridden, incapacitated. Man, I actually think that's actually one of my top reasons you would have this. So right off the bat, you already know. You're gonna fill the box. You might even, you let the, the rescue know if the rescue doesn't have this information. Right off the bat, boom. School with handicapped students. Guys, believe it or not, with all these charter schools and older schools, sometimes they lease out their space as the student body contracts. They actually lease it out to these little mini schools, to other independent operators who then are working with um, special type of students. Old school that you've seen forever that might be elementary or junior high, whatever, could have two other schools that are dealing with handicapped students. So get in there and find out about this one. Special extinguishing systems. My experience has been that most, all major cities have buildings like this. And they don't really say be, uh, because you won't see any special signage because they don't want to give out clues to what's inside. Special communications, telephone, internet, uh, obviously a ton of proprietary uh, expensive equipment. Uh, 
And now with uh, more electronics, crypto and all that, uh, you know, it's uh, special compartmented information. But we need to know. Now you get in there and you become trapped because they make it so hard to get in and they don't really consider getting out. Siamese locations, location OS and Y. And look, these outside screwing yokes, most guys don't come across this in their career. So they, yeah, they learned it in, in the academy and then they forget it. And I've been on incidents where, you know, the guys don't know how to operate those. So in an emergency, you know, you have to shut off the water. Yeah, when you see those, take a real good look and make sure everybody uh, is aware, okay? A lot of guys will have pride and, and pretend that they haven't forgot, but go over it. This one, man, on these old buildings, wow. Where they have a couple, basement, right? Basement and cellar, what's the difference? If you don't know, find out. <laughs> Guard dogs, well, anyway, we have tools for that. And, and so on and so on. Number four, based on department op, op procedure, strategy, and tactics should be defined by the organization. Should define the SOPs, right? Should define the initial strategy and tactics. That's pretty standard for most departments. I would think for all departments, right? For a coordinated deployment of department, okay, yeah. That's what we have SOPs for. Okay, the initial units, responding units understand and implement the operational goals and tactics, right? You, that you pretty much are clear on what to do when you arrive, where you're en route, okay, right? Not just so much about arriving, but right when you start off, that your communications and uh, along the route and when uh, you're approaching and upon arrival. And guys, we cover all that in the commanding the job online training in detail, which is really geared for guys about to take the, the command seat, senior men, you know, guys who may be tapped to be acting officers. Okay. And then the IC will build on the current strategy, incorporate the necessary incident management components. Okay, yes. You have your initial and the SOP, but then when you get in there, you implement the rest of it until you're properly relieved by superior. Okay, and the goal of effective fire ground operations is to increase the safety of our members, eliminate confusion, and prevent the loss of life. Right, guys? And it'd be nice if everybody was on the same page on that. SOPs must consider numerous factors that prevent operations, that affect operations, affect operations. This will ensure essential strategic, tactical, and task level functions are performed. Incident commander to plan and implement an effective strategy and incident action plan. As, as the job gets more evolved, division group supervisors to formulate and follow tactics, company officers to successfully carry out the tasks, and the individual members to effectively perform their duties, right? When it all works well, that's how it looks like. Obviously, the strategy and tactics of an incident are dictated by the size up, initial risk assessment, right? and situation report by the first arriving officer. How important is, is it, right, for that first officer to get in there in a calm voice, state what he sees and what he thinks is gonna happen. Uh, when you when you first survive, do that 360 size up. And if not, if you can't do 360, you get some, uh, the size up of the Charlie side may be delegated to another fire department unit. That's right, you gotta know how your rear is before you go in there busting through the front. Unless there's an obvious life safety issue exists, visible victims requiring immediate assistance, interior firefighting operations should not commence until a report from side Charlie is received. That's hard. <laughs> that's hard. But hey, that's stuff to work on. It's really hard, right? When you see that those flames busting through the front, second, third floor, right? Heavy, medium or heavy fire smoke. A uh, radio report of conditions, including those on the Charlie side. Side Charlie should be transmitted over the sign technical channel to the IC. But don't forget, guys, you're the IC, right? You're first arriving. You're the IC until you're properly relieved by a superior officer and the dispatcher. The transmission should include the following smoke and fire conditions. And if, and if you can identify the seat of the fire right there, that's great. Right, uh, you, you, your department may have a unique signal or the dispatch uh, or the FCC, right? The fire command 
communication center may have a signal for working fire. Number of stories, the type of occupancy, and the location of fire. All right, and this lays the foundation for additional reports and serves as notification to responding units, right? Notification to responding units as to the type of SOPs to implement, right? How you're riding along and you can't wait to hear it. Any critical building information, right, um, if you're lucky. Right, if you have a SID, okay, building features, the number of stories, it gives a difference between your size. Like uh, you might have, it might be higher in the back, more stories or less stories. Basement access, any other, any change. So operational priorities must be, uh, about the size of should be clearly communicated to command. Uh, you may have policies that dictate that the incoming battalion chief, battalion um, will be taking up a command position and he'll be command. But remember, you're, you're a command if you arrive first. Okay, you have your responsibilities, so there are necessary tasks, right, which we need to occur at any fire as initial on-scene report upon arrival, initial risk assessment, situation report, water supply, deployment of hand lines, backup hand lines, search and rescue, ventilation, initial rapid intervention crews, ground ladder, ground and aerial ladder placement, fire attack, and extinguishment, salvage and overhaul. And of course, the famous RECOVS. All that covered and commanding the job for that initial IC. Takes you from beginning until the point where you have overhaul. Okay, procedures developed for fire ground ops must be flexible enough to allow the change due to life hazard. First priority, right? That's both fire and civilians or uh, occupants. Problems with water supply and water application that you would immediately put on the radio. Uh, volume and extent of fire requiring large caliber streams, right? Heavy fire, big fire, big water. You gotta let people know. Location of the fire and accessible for handline operations. Cause all these could definitely change your, your strategy. Materials involved in the fire and exposure potential, exposure problems, stability of the structure. Guys, all these situations right here, I literally have experienced whether myself or my brothers or sisters in the fire department, they've all been major incidents, and especially when we worked with, um, when we're working with other departments, you know, some fatalities. It's this is all real. Nothing here that I've seen has not occurred. And then it gets into the actual incident. Fire departments should review procedures on the use and deployment of writs. I think, it, yeah, in this situation, they had to put the writ to work in a non-writ capacity, and then they had a call for a, a ladder. So what the recommendation is, must maintain a, a writ anytime they're operating in IDLH, okay, that it should be in the department's incident management system and, and par, and I believe a par of what didn't occur here. Of course, with the May, with the May Day, and I uh, by now all departments should have a May Day and a, a par sequence to follow when needed. Critical fire ground operations and staffing needs sh should be continu continuously evaluated, and that's where your situational awareness comes in, right, guys? Crew resource management. Anticipate what you're going to need. Call them in and stage nearby. And resource assignments should be made with the goal of having a writ function in place at our times. Yes, yes, obviously, right? I think we all strive for that. And then sometimes you got to put people to work, but hey. The following restrictions regarding the use of writ should be considered. All right. Writ should not be used for firefighting operations, right? And if you have to put the writ to work on some fire ground tasks, right? You should strive to have somebody to brief the incoming writ team. So they get their report of what's going on. When the IC puts the writ to work to assign another on-scene company to stand by as the writ. And if there's no writ, no units available, must assign at least two members to act as a writ while waiting the special called writ to arrive. What else we got? Okay, of course I have the recommended equipment. That should be in your writ team um, SOP. Oh yes, of course, if you're put in place as, as part of the writ team, Right, uh, you're gonna look for ways in and out of the structure. You're gonna look at the fire escape construction features, right? You're gonna monitor the tactical channel. And that's why it pays to review your department's SOP, rate SOP, before you ever get assigned, you know, uh, one day when you least suspect it to come in as the RIT team. Even if you're an engine company, I have definitely served as RIT 
Um, as an engine company, as no ladders were available, right? Uh, as an engine company, you get assigned to roof work. That just all goes with the territory, especially if you're in a busy town with a lot of jobs. If you're in a volunteer company, right guys, a combination, forget it. it you, can, you expect to be everything and undermanned until the task force arrives. Okay, uh, once the rest determine the need for egress ladder, windows, we should be clean, of course, right? We clean our, our windows. Okay, it's all good stuff to be reviewed. After the above tasks are complete, the writ shall inform the command that a 360 survey is complete and the writ is ready to intervene if necessary. Okay, once the incident scene survey has been completed, the writ's equipment is in place, the entire writ can be located in an area. Yes, writ team operations. Right, in an area immediately accessible to the building. All right, another consideration for command is to request a response of an advanced life support engine company or truck company. Well, in, in, in my towns, except for the major city, um, EMS was just a, a different operation altogether. You know, we didn't, it wasn't part of the fire department. Great officer of it, members were coordinated with the IC to formulate rescue plan contingencies and continue to mount to the area. Okay, that's nice. Uh, by this time, the IC is just, you know, the IC is flooded with information. If you're the red officer, just stay on top of everything. And uh, recommendation number six, ensure all firefighters, fire officers are trained when to call a May Day. Every department has a May Day procedure, right guys? But the problem with calling a May Day is no one wants to look like a jerk and call a May Day, right? They, this is why firefighters die. They call it in too late. Guys, call for a May Day. Better to look like a jerk and swallow a little pride if, you know, if you survive, than to not call it and really make it a worse situation for your brothers and sisters to come to your rescue. Hit that button or just call May Day. And if you hear a May Day, then repeat it, guys. And you gotta come home alive. May Day tactical checklist, that's right. Lunar, location, unit assigned, name assistance needed, and resources needed. Okay, that's the information. If you hear a mayday, that's the information the IC should have so you can work on that. Because it becomes a whole different command scene and incident once mayday is declared. Right, everybody should have a PAR, uh, personnel accountability system. And this job was interesting, man. Um, that senior man from the ladder company, when the officer fell off the roof, he noticed it. He did a part among the members of his team on the roof. Like they crouched and they accounted for each other. That was pretty cool. That's that senior man. And then I, I read in the report and then he kind of like took over. And right, this is what we do, right? We train to stay alive, but we also train uh, to take charge, right? We are we're responsible. We're our brother's keeper. Personnel accountability system. These are different systems uh, you have for what they call resource accountability. And if you have safety officers, you find out you have all these things that you have to work on. And look, sometimes you could be tapped to do this right on the scene, <laughs> all right? Get nosy. If you don't come across these devices regularly, make that training one day. Because you never know uh, on a large scale incident where you what you get tapped to do, whether it's a chief's aid, accountability, man, it's just so many jobs. And especially as you become more senior, whether you're a private or a, a lower grade, you know, company officer. Recommendation number nine, annual proficiency training and evaluation on fire ground operations. Okay. If your department has the staffing, uh, the training personnel, the money. Number 10, IC assigns a safety officer as early in the incident as possible. No doubt. Let me tell you, uh, if you guys are operating out there without sufficient safety officers, you better get on the union. Safety officers are for you, try to protect you. Staff aid, again, right? If your department has the money, the staffing, manning, procedures for it. Require the use of sprinkler systems. Of course, they'll complain that they can't pay for them. Structure involves the type three ordinary, three-story mercantile residential occupancy, see? Apartments on the uh, upstairs floors with a full basement. Structure was built in 1919. Brick walls, wooden floors, flat wooden roof. Contents represented a heavy fire load. Fire development beyond incipient stage presents one of the greatest risks firefighters are exposed to during fire ground operations. Yes, it can be dramatically reduced with sprinklers. Right? You would assume that with such a heavy fire load, but 
Finally, by controlling fire development, the fire risk associated with the potential for structure collapse and during overhaul operations are greatly reduced if not eliminated. Guys, I hope you enjoyed. I really hope it helps you in some way. And if you are interested, head on over to firecram.com and check out our courses, especially for those aspiring to company grade or may get tapped to be acting company officers. I think we have products that would definitely help you. And even if you're getting ready to test for promotion. Thank you.